So greetings from California. Uh, I am so honored today to introduce you to Michelle Pekansky Brock, who's one of our North Stars in online faculty professional development in California. Uh, and I think throughout the nation as an author, speaker, and a thought leader in online education, Michelle has been instrumental in helping California Community College faculty close the success gap in online learning and her grace in working with difficult different constituencies that was a freudian slip there um, <laughs> even the most resistant to change has made me a forever fan and a grateful colleague her work in helping faculty put the each in teaching is inspirational and i know that you'll soon see why her work is so important during these trying and crazy times uh, thank you michelle for joining us i'd like to turn it over to you Thank you so much, Candice. Um, that was probably the best introduction I've ever had. Uh, <laughs> that meant a lot. Uh, I am so honored to be here. I'd like to thank you and Nate and Samantha for inviting me to be one of the phenomenal speakers that are joining you all today. Uh, just from the way that this session, this, this, my presentation has been introduced and um, the very mindful uh, prompts that have been provided to you already and the, the way that chat has been used, I think that um, you're already demonstrating so much of um, all that we need to do to cultivate the sense of humanity in our student in our classes. So I'm a little, I have to say I'm humbled, you know, a lot of times I speak with groups that um, are kind of new to this concept of emotion and um, I can sense that clearly this is a group that is very invested in it. So uh, before I get started, I do want to share that I've been teaching in the California Community College system. I started teaching um, in 1999. I taught full time, uh, primarily face to face, uh, starting in 2002. In 2003, I started teaching one or two online courses regularly. Um, and I did that through about 2009. The past 10 years or so, I've transitioned into a full time faculty support role. So I've been supporting online faculty development since that time. Uh, much of what I bring into that work is taken from my own teaching, which over the years has evolved into this thing that we call humanizing, particularly, uh, which is becoming more and more of a movement in California public higher education and the California community college system and the California State University system. And it's amazing to see some of these concepts pick up traction and adoption um, in our institutions that are committed to, um, to access for diverse groups of students. I also want to acknowledge my own positionality as I start to um, engage this conversation. It's very much about equity. And uh, as a person who is white, I definitely want to recognize the privileges that that has afforded to me and continues to afford to me, as well as other privileges like uh, my middle age, my able body, my cisgender, and um, speaking English as a first language. I think that those are all things that bring me privilege and I'm continuing, I'm committed to recognizing those privileges and thinking about how they, they, they shape the way I look at things and the way that um, I interact with people, who I include, who I amplify, and all of those other sorts of dimensions. So I just wanted to get started with that before I share my slides because my positionality is um, clearly going to be embedded within the lens that, um, that I share the ideas with you today. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with sharing my slides. Give me just a second here to get set up. And if someone can just let me know if you can see the slide that says the anatomy of learning. Yes, we can see that. Is it a good time to put the link to your slides in the chat box? That would be phenomenal. Thank you. Okay, great. I have my chat open. I can still see that. So okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for, for sharing that link, uh, Candace. You're all welcome to access those slides now or later, whatever fits your preferences. So folks, now that all of us are online educators, it's really important that we reflect on some things, including the way that the media has publicly shamed online education for many years, because now we are entering this space. 
And some of these messages may be tainting the way that we feel about teaching online and creating some barriers for us. It's widely known, it is a fact, that online courses exacerbate racial and ethnic success gaps that occur in face-to-face -face college courses. So they're exacerbated online. That's a fact, we know that from the data. Articles like this one from 2019 point out that our weakest students, quote, weakest students are more likely to fail if they take an online course and suggest that online courses naturally by some, just, just because they're online, water down the interaction between a student and an instructor. So I want us to really unpack this and think critically about these, these words, these messages. And this 2018 article from the New York Times implied that, quote, less proficient students are simply incapable of learning at a distance. These two articles represent the deficit mindset about students that we apply in higher education and that we are trying to change. Describing our students of color as weak or less proficient places the blame squarely on our students. And at the same time, it conveys a hierarchy of those who are superior, who are our white and our Asian students who succeed at rates above the average success rates, and those who are less than, or our Black or African American students, or Latinx students, or Native American and Alaskan Native students. Now, if we approach the same problem through a def different lens, through, a, through an equity-minded lens, we see it differently. This is a quote that the second I saw it, I felt, wow, it really embodies this concept of equity. When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. Equity recognizes that when students have access to what they need, they will all have the opportunity to succeed. Equity is about removing barriers for all students. This is, a, this is very different from the lens of equality through which we're used to looking at what we do in higher education. Equality sounds more like all students need to be treated the same in order to be fair. And the problem with that lens is that treating students the same implies that they are all the same. And that's not the case. So we are going to look at teaching online through an equity-minded lens today. One thing is true. When you teach online, your students are names on a screen. And that's a problem if that's the way your course stays, right? We, that, that's a problem, having students just be names on a screen. Because when we relate to our students as names on a screen, it dehumanizes them. And it also dehumanizes us to our students. It breaks that critical relationship between an instructor and a student, which is part of those articles that we just considered. As Donna Ford has said, the less we know about people, the more we make up. In a dehumanized online course, instructors are influenced more heavily by stereotypes that negatively influence our perception of our students' intellectual abilities. This relates to our unconscious biases. A study from 2018 by Baker, D, and Evans, which I have cited on the last slide in my slide deck, found that, in, found that instructors were 94% more likely to respond to discussion posts in online courses that were perceived to be written by white male students than any other racial, ethnic, or gender combination. I'm gonna say that again. A study from 2018 found that instructors in online courses were 94% more likely to respond to discussion posts that they perceived to be by white male students than any other racial, ethnic, gender combination. Dehumanizing students is a convenient way to sideline the need to recognize and interrogate our unconscious biases. Also, if we look at the demographics of faculty in higher education, we see a gap there. It's clear that those who teach courses are predominantly white, while the students that we serve are becoming more and more diverse. The educational experiences of white professors are not void of struggle by any means. 
but they are void of the biases that people of color experience in the United States. Research shows that students with black and brown skin are treated as less than starting at a very early age in school. Their teachers in K-12 who are largely white and female are less likely to assign them challenging tasks. That means they're less likely to develop from dependent into independent learners. The research of Luke Wood highlights the ways black boys are criminalized in schools starting in preschool. They're more likely to be assumed to be troublemakers. And when incidents arise, teachers cue them differently than white students. For example, they may automatically be disciplined while a white student may be asked after doing the same thing, now is that the right way to handle this situation? Our past educational experiences shape our expectations of our students, how we present material, what we say to students, how we grade, and so much more. For those who ascribe to this majority culture, it is difficult to see, ultimately. This perpetuating cycle reinforces a worldview that leaves out students from non-minority majority groups, those who are Black or African American, Latinx, Native American, or LGBTQ students, people with disabilities, and other identities that intersect with one or more of these identities. And this, is cult and, and this is the culture that perpetuates that prevalent use of deficit language to describe our students, as if it's just natural to do so. But what if we began to recognize that we don't have students who are underprepared? What if we began to envision all of our students as being prepared differently? When we design and teach a course, whether that course be in a physical classroom or online, when we design and teach a course that intentionally recognizes students as diverse humans with rich, complex stories that stretch back in time, we begin to understand that the educational traumas they have experienced in preschool, grade school, junior high, high school, and other college classes shape their mindsets about their intellectual abilities. This internal dialogue triggers stress hormones that are released in their brains, which derails our students' ability to make judgments, track details, and achieve their full intellectual capability. This self-doubt and these feelings of unbelonging derail students all the time. And when students learn online in normal circumstances, it can intensify these feelings of isolation. And folks, this fall, as you know, we're facing an extra special recipe as we approach teaching, a global viral pandemic and a national racial pandemic. More of our students are stressed, more are depressed, more are fearful of judgment, more are learning in homes where they don't feel safe. Those who are housing insecure are now living with the intensified worries of where they will sleep tonight as well as where they will learn tonight. But there's a solution to this problem. And this is the hope that we'll be focusing on for the rest of this presentation. And it does not involve a fancy, shiny, expensive new technology either. It starts with you and understanding the anatomy of learning. As a college professor, I bet you're familiar with Bloom's Taxonomy's Cognitive Domain of Learning, which represents or presents a hierarchical tiered step process for developing higher level thinking skills. This is almost always included in every instructional faculty development program of some sort, right? Whether it's learning how to teach it face to face or in the classroom, it's almost always included there. But as this group, as all of you are aware, there is another dimension of learning that is much less privileged in higher education, and it's that effective dimension of learning, the feeling and the sensing side. And learning occurs in the intersection of those two dimensions. And it's really fascinating to reflect on the separation of thinking and understanding from feeling and sensing 
and to see that it's rooted in the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe, which is referred to in Western history as the period of enlightenment, but it's also the period of colonization. Indigenous cultures are rooted in duality that values both thinking and understanding and feeling and sensing. If you feel struggle when trying to comprehend learning as a cultural construction, that's normal. For when we are part of a culture, its components are invisible to us unless we intentionally strive to see them. It's like trying to get a fish to become aware of the water that it swims in. This is hard and important work for us to do. And for more on this topic, I just want to refer you to Laura Rendon's book, um, Sente Pensente, Sensing, Thinking, Pedagogy. When we recognize value and support the effective dimensions of learning, we're not working on soft skills, first of all. Let's really hone in on that phrase. That phrase undermines the courageous efforts that are part of being vulnerable. And if you're familiar with the work of Brene Brown, who I'm a huge fan of, Brene Brown likes to remind us that vulnerability feels like weakness, but it looks like courage to others. And so as you feel your vulnerability moving into this new term, embrace that. Because when you share that vulnerability with your students, it's where connection starts. It's what breeds empathy. Also, it's employing an anti-racist pedagogy, one that flips a worldview that privileges white individualistic culture, ensures learning is anchored in psychological safety and positive relationships, and sets a stage for transformative liberatory pedagogy. And I'm so thrilled to know that you're going to be hearing from my colleague and dear friend, Fabiola Torres later today, because she is going to take you deeper into that um, journey. In the design of teaching our courses, again, in a classroom or online, this is really all about good teaching practices. We must acknowledge the social and psychological nature of learning, performance, and motivation. We must intentionally implement interventions and cues that change the narrative by which our students interpret their difficulties. Some of those promising interventions that I'm um, taking out of the article that is quoted at the bottom of this slide, which is an excellent point of reference for anyone who wants to dig deeper, include writing about their fears, having students write about their fears, exposing students to role models with similar identities, envisioning their possible future selves, and sharing a personally important value, like a family or a friend. These interventions, while simple, re-sculpt the narrative of learning for students who have experienced learning traumas. And all of us have learning traumas, and I want you to really reflect on your own. Reflecting on my own have really made me help understand, um, you know, the ways that my feelings have shaped the way I perceive my abilities. They also help our students to see a pathway ahead filled with opportunities, a pathway that's hopeful, as opposed to a pathway filled with obstacles. I referenced the work of Laura Rendon once already, but her work on validation theory is also really key here. Again, it's anchored in face-to-face -face teaching, but it applies directly to what we do online. This is work that she did decades ago in colleges with large populations of first-generation and low-income students. Students in the studies referred to the question, when did you know you could become successful in college? And from the qualitative data, here are some themes that emerged. When an instructor took time to learn my name. When an instructor gave me opportunities to see myself be successful. When I could see myself in the course's curriculum. When an instructor became a partner in my learning. One of the key themes in Rendon's research is the relationship with a caring professor. And we see this theme surface again more recently in a 2016 study of online community college students 
that looked at how different course design features influence student performance and grades. The study found that the only significant predictor of student grades was quality instructor to student interactions in online courses. Now notice that I said quality instead of quantity. It's less about how often you interact with students and more about how you interact with them that influences motivation and engagement. And from the data, we see quality being linked again with a caring instructor. Those are words that came from the students. So we are here today to learn about humanizing online teaching and learning. And at the heart of humanizing is instructor to student relationship, is the instructor to student relationship. They are the connective tissue between students, engagement, and rigor. You are essential to your student's success. You know it in your gut, in your right, especially your students who are experiencing trauma and who have experienced trauma in education. Now, when we teach online, we need to look at humanizing differently. As instructors, we're used to thinking about teaching starting on day one, right? When you walk into that class and you see your students. But mindsets influence students well before a course starts, and they can be a factor that contributes to students actually not logging in at all to an online course. So if you're noticing that students aren't logging in like you expect them to on day one, keep this in mind. The period that starts before day one, that pre-course period, um, and that stretches all the way through week one, is really a high opportunity zone for you. It's an opportunity to reduce belongingness and certainty that undermines the success of many students. So we're going to now dig into the big question, how might we change our students' narrative by sending cues of caring and belonging from that very first click, which we hope is before the course starts. I'm going to highlight a few hopeful practices that are taken from the humanizing movement underway in California public higher education Several of these practices are discussed further in the article and cited, um, that's cited and linked at the bottom of this slide. So if you want to dig in later um, and read more and see some more goodies, you can go ahead and do that. So one of these practices is a liquid syllabus. I'm going to just play a quick video for you. Hi, scholars. My name is Katie Whitman Conklin, and I'm going to be your instructor this semester. A little bit about me. I lived in the Central Valley of California for a lot of years. So that's just a quick clip of a liquid syllabus. Um, I meant to set that up a little bit be better before that video started, but a liquid syllabus. We all have a syllabus, right? And we're used to kind of preparing that syllabus with some tool that is intended, or I should say is, is, is native to print. So maybe Microsoft Word or maybe an event turns into a PDF and those documents can look beautiful, they can be engaging, they can be written with inclusive language, um, but what they don't do is render well on a smartphone and they're often also locked behind a learning management system. So what if we were to send a welcome email to students before a course starts with a simple click to tap a syllabus and have it open and render beautifully on a phone? And that's what you can do if you use a web page creation tool like simply Google Sites to create a liquid syllabus. The other benefit of a liquid syllabus is that right at the top of that, um, that page, you can embed a welcome video of you. And that's gonna cue your students, I'm human just like you. It's gonna encourage them to lean in. It's gonna break down that hierarchy between you and them. They'll start to perceive you as a real person. A few tips, keep that video brief, just a couple of minutes. Let it be imperfect. Share a story about yourself. Illuminate a struggle. Be vulnerable. And I've got some tips down at the bottom about some tools you might want to try. Don't forget about your smartphone. It's the most underused video creation tool out there in higher education. And I'm sure you'll be learning more about that from Fabiola Torres later today. Also included in that, um, that liquid syllabus, a very hopeful strategy is to include a learning pact that signals to your students that you are a partner in their learning. And that pact includes two things. It includes things that your students can expect from you, and it includes things that you will expect from them. 
within this pact, it really starts to articulate to students what your values are, how you approach teaching, what your teaching philosophy looks like, and it sets up the culture of the learning environment that your students are stepping into. Um, I do want to point out that number eight on each of the, the sample pack that I provided here to you is an invitation to add something else. So if you share this with students ahead of a course during that pre course period and then actually during the course, perhaps you want to include it in a discussion in your course and invite students to look at it one more time and add an, a response to the discussion with maybe something that they want to add here or just a simple affirmation that they agree to the pack the way it is. It's a helpful way to start your course. Oh, and by the way, that is shared pub in public domain. You're welcome to use and adapt it without permission. Another really helpful and simple strategy that all of us can implement is to include a getting to know you survey at the start of your course. The survey can include lots of different types of questions. So I'm just going to give you some samples to kind of get your mind thinking. And I know probably a lot of you do this already, but this cues to students that their story matters. We can ask students, what are your preferred pronouns? We can let them know, hey, I'd like to leave you feedback in video format this semester. Does that work for you? And let them choose. Yeah, that sounds great. Or no thanks, I prefer written feedback because video doesn't work for everyone for lots of different reasons. And we're not here to judge those reasons, but it is important for us to understand what our students' needs are. Tell me about your goals, an open-ended question. And these last two questions are super, super helpful, at least I have found. In one word, describe how you're feeling about this class. In that response, you are going to instantly be able to know who needs your high touch. The students that say, I'm anxious, I'm overwhelmed, I'm nervous. There'll also be students who say, just fine, excited, can't wait to get started, right? But that's a wonderful way to just probe and start to identify those high opportunity students. And also please share one thing that may interfere with your success in this class. So you're asking students through, through their lens, what is it they see as a barrier? And you're gonna see all kinds of different things here. I've had students share with me that they have anxiety, which of course opens up an opportunity for, for that student and I to have a conversation about that, to be sure that the student is, uh, is clear and aware of how to connect with, um, with mental health support on campus or online, which hopefully is provided online at your institution. Um, I've also had students share with me, hey, I'm, I'm pregnant and I'm gonna deliver my baby halfway through the term. So being aware of those things sets me up with opportunities to support my students. When you kick off your course, going back to some of this, those important, those valuable interventions that we talked about earlier about minding the gap, include an icebreaker at the start that has this kind of self-affirmation, this value affirmation embedded in it. This is gonna to signal to your students that they are valued. And one that I use in my class, now I teach the history of photography, but I think anyone could do this. It's just an example. Share a photograph of someone or something important to you and share why it's important. It helps students to see connections and make connections between one another. And it also lets them start the course off with confidence by sharing something that is important and valuable to them. And it recognizes the diversity in the stories that your students bring to your course. And another really hopeful practice is the wisdom wall. Uh, we talked about seeing role models. So this is a simple way to do this. Um, the wisdom wall cues students, if you did it, so can I. And this is the way it works. You can do this with lots of different tools. I like using VoiceThread, uh, which is a tool that I have access to. Um, you could do this in a Google Doc. You could do this with Flipgrid. There's lots of different ways to do it. But essentially, you have students share successful strategies after an exam or at the end of your course. I do this, I've done this traditionally at the end of the course. So I ask them to look back at where they were at the beginning of the course, think about how they felt and what, what have they learned about the course? What do they know now that they wish they had known then? And share those golden nuggets in a comment, in a voice comment or a video comment. And then you take those comments and you share them with future students as they come into the course. So as they're coming into the course, they are listening to, they're seeing their peers 
and they're understanding struggles that are shared and seeing that they did it, they were successful and I can be successful too. And lastly, be a warm demander. This is a pedagogical approach, culturally responsive teaching um, approach that links back to the work of Kleinfeld from the 1970s. It's also included um, in Zaretta Hammond's wonderful book, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain that I'm just going to hold up with lots of markers in it because I look at it, I refer to it all the time. Super helpful book. Warm demanders are intrusive. When you see students not logging in, which you're aware of because you're looking for those things, when you notice the students who are late with assignments, you have to be intrusive. You reach out to them. You don't wait for them to come to you because there are all kinds of reasons why they're not leaning in. It's up to you to reach out, be intrusive. Don't wait until it's too late. Hold them to high standards. Cultivate the full intellectual capacity of your students. It's not about being soft with them. It's about pushing them. Rigor derives through empathy in this type of pedagogy. And what you see is that students will push themselves to not let you down. Again, it starts with that relationship, but it's not just about relationship. It's about engaging and motivating all students. And with that, I just want to say that you've got this. You know all of this and um, it's, it's all just about cultivating that relationship at the start because if you don't start with trust you don't start with psychological safety if you don't start with that relationship between you and your students then we can't get to that next phase we can't get to the warm demander phase so that's why that's so important to start there and it can happen online it does happen online so um, feel hope about that and that's the end of my presentation. We do have a little bit of time left. Wow, thank you, Michelle. That was, that was amazing. We do have some questions coming in, so please do put those in the, in the chat. Uh, we have one from Robin Evans. How do you manage all the modes of communication with students, especially when you teach multiple sections and have layers of administrative and reporting responsibilities, which is a fabulous question. So I think what's really critical at the beginning of your course is that you think about how you want students to communicate with you. So I don't have multiple modes of communication with my students. Uh, what I do is I set up different ways for them to get their questions answered. One way is to have a discussion forum where they're welcome to post general questions about the course, um, being sure that they understand you put something there, the whole class will see it, anyone can respond. And that allows for other students to step up and, and help other students. But if there's a question that's personal in nature, that's something that I'd want them to come directly to me. Um, and so I realize we all teach with different learning management systems. I use Canvas. And I, I, I ask all of my students to communicate with me through the Canvas inbox. And that keeps my uh, communications with my students very organized because I can click on a student name and see the whole history of my communication with them during a term. Uh, so it is important to think about how you want students to communicate with you to include that in your syllabus your communication policy at the start of the course and let students know what kind of response time to expect from you. And a good practice there is, is 24 hours in, re in return. If you're getting a ton of questions about, I can't figure this out, I don't know where to do this, that's, that signals a problem. So pay attention to what the questions are about because you shouldn't be getting a ton of, of inquiries from students um, about your course. That's probably more of a signal that your course design needs to be improved in some way. So that, that's some thoughts about that that I hope are helpful. There was, there was another question from Lisa. Uh, when you teach multiple sections, how do you keep track of individual students' needs? That's a great question too. So um, again, I, I do apologize. I realize that a lot of my responses are Canvas specific because that is the learning management system that I'm used to and that we use across our whole system of now 116 community colleges in California. Um, 
And I don't know if other learning management systems have this built in, but here's a tip. Um, there's a notes column in the grades area of Canvas. If you go in, it's usually not turned on by default, but you can en enable the notes column. And so what I do as those responses are coming into the survey, which a really easy way to do that getting to know you survey is to do it in Google Forms because that produces a spreadsheet and you can simply track, right, the responses. So if I look at that one question in one word, how are you feeling about that course? I'll look for those students who, and I tag them in the grade book. I'll look for the things that they say, what are they, what's one barrier for their, of their success that they perceive this semester? And I'll make a note of those things in the grade book. It's in the notes column, only I see it, students don't see it. And that way, as you're moving forward in, in the rest of the course, you can lean on that data, that qualitative data, that micro data about your students and adapt your teaching to meet those needs. Um, and I do think that, you know, kind of incorporating that into your course is really important. If you don't have that notes column though, you can include, you know, have a, have a section of your course that only you can see, but your students can't see. So something that's unpublished. And you can include the link to the, the, the sheet that includes those responses right there. And so it's, it's easy to access within the course, uh, which is usually you know, where the, the assessment and the grading is being done. Michelle, I have a question. Um, I have a question about, I wanna ask this on behalf of the faculty who are struggling with this modality, who never signed up to teach online. You know, you mentioned about course design that a lot of student questions when when they're struggling with technology or course design, you know, what advice do you have for faculty who just didn't sign up for this and are struggling? My advice is take every hug that you can get. <laughs> I mean, I, I say that, but I, I really mean it. I just have to say that I You know, developing one quality online course is a huge undertaking even after you've been prepared and you understand the nuts and the bolts of course design and developing relationships at a distance. Um, so it, it's, it's super hard. Um, it's so important to give yourself grace and to know that you're not going to do something exceptional within every regard the first time around, but you do want to start somewhere. So I would say set reasonable goals for yourself. Um, there are a lot of faculty who are leaning on Zoom for, for kind of delivering the content instead of developing it asynchronously. Um, I would really try to encourage there to be some blending of asynchronous and synchronous. So maybe you want to have, if you are having students meet in Zoom, take it as an opportunity to also, you know, create discussions where students can join in and participate and, and, and um, engage in discussions asynchronously as well. The asynchronous modality um, does, really does support more rhythms of learning. Some people, you know, they take, like me, it takes time to process. Like, you know, tonight is when I'm gonna come up with great responses to all these questions, I guarantee you. And they're all such good ones. But give yourself grace, think, you know, ahead of time, if this is my first time doing this and how many courses am I preparing, what do I feel is reasonable for me to do? And what might be reasonable the next semester? I, I know we don't want to even think about that right now. Um, but it's, I think about teaching, particularly when I started teaching online, it was like building a skyscraper and you don't start at the top. You have to start with kind of, you know, building the foundations. So being clear about being clear about communicating to your students what's going to happen in your course. If they are going to be meeting synchronously, when is that? If not, tell them that too. Students are now going to be stepping into multiple course environments that all have different expectations and they don't know what those are. So those ex expectations need to be conveyed clearly at the start of the term. And uh, I think that's probably, gosh, the most important thing right now. Thank you. I have a couple more questions coming in. Nate asked a good question that you kind of answered. It says, I'm wondering about how students interact with one another as humans. And, and I would add to that, you know, how can we help them uh, facilitate that? Yeah, so um, here's what I typically see with um, 
the student to student interaction. Um, I hear faculty say, well, you know, I put discussions in my courses and the students just, they just don't respond to them. They just, they have these quick responses and that is part of a bigger problem. Um, discussions need to be, need to also have clear expectations. So if you're expecting your students to respond to something, what is it that, what are your expectations about those responses? Um, and you may wish to develop a rubric that is an effective practice with course design. Rubrics can be, you know, basically the, the baseline of your expectations. Um, what we want to see is more rich interactions. And when we start with trust, which is the foundation of relationships and leaning in, which when you ask your students to participate in a discussion online, you want them, you expect them to lean in. That is a form of trust that, re that requires trust. So you've got to start with that trust and then move into the engagement and thinking about thinking about using prompts again that do help students to connect what you're learning about with, with their with their stories with the real world. Um, that those are super helpful. Um, and when you're learning online, you know, it, it is an opportunity to have students bring in media, to have students share images or ask them to go, go talk to someone, go, have an, go interview someone um, about this topic and then come into the discussion and share what you learned. So think about how you're setting students up for the discussion and think beyond the edges of, read, of, the, of what you expect your students to read. Think about making those real world connections. Yeah, discussions do need to be carefully constructed. They also need to be open ended, right? They need to elicit this kind of open ended uh, response. And oftentimes they, they're not written that way. So really think about what it is that your, your students are reading and whether or not that prompt is, is designed effectively. Yeah, storytelling. And you're, at, I'm setting up Fabiola. Um, you're just going to love the examples and the strategies that she's going to share later. So I think that you're all of these questions about like what more can we do, the the power, the importance of storytelling. Absolutely, that is 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 a, is such a hopeful strategy and a humanizing strategy. And we know from storytelling, neuroscience. And I when I learned this, I thought it was fascinating. When a person tells a story, if I were telling you a story right now. The, the parts of my brain that activate are the same parts of the brain that activate in your brain as you listen to me tell the story. So by sharing stories, it's a way of fostering empathy. Um, and that's a great strategy to bring in. Wonderful. I have a, a few more questions. I'm not sure we're gonna get to all of them, but I do have one interesting question about theory. These strategies are helpful, but I'd like to go back to the term humanizing. What are your philosophical bases for defining this term what are the wisdom traditions that inform it? Oh, yeah. So wisdom traditions. Wow, that's a fascinating concept, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very candid about my, again, my positionality. And I am, I've been coming into this through such a different lens. I came into this through theories of social presence in distance learning. And the deeper and social presence theory, the research, which is huge, shows that when students perceive you, you're in, the instructor and their peers as real people, then they are more connected to a group, right? That, I don't consider that wisdom theory, right? It's, it comes out of a very specific discourse about distance education. So as I've become more involved with this, I'm starting to see the roots in more of the, the, the wisdom theories. Um, I've been looking at universal design for learning that acknowledges diversity of um, the variability of learning, the work of Laura Rendong, which I referenced, is a huge part of, of what's contributing to humanizing. And I would refer you to that article that um, from 2020 um, that's co-authored by me and Mike Smedshammer and Kim Vincent Layton, if you'd like to dig deeper into some of that theoretical framework, which is evolving. We wrote that article last summer. If we wrote it today, it would be referencing different elements. Um, we're working on a larger humanizing STEM academy and the research in that space is phenomenal um, because the gaps in STEM are bigger than the gaps in any other discipline cl cluster. So um, I hope that answers that question. 
that was a big question. It was a big answer, but I think it was very helpful. Uh, there's this is an interesting question. We're gonna we're gonna have to wrap this up shortly, but I I want to ask this one. There's a strong push to standardize LMSs across courses on a campus, a common template. I'm troubled by this, but I'd like to hear your perspectives. So I would say that question. Those are two different things. Standardizing a learning management system and standard uh, using a template are two different things. Um, I do think that when students are engaging in the same system, it does create some um, familiarity. It relieves a lot of that cognitive loan, load and that stress of where do I need to go for this course. So personally, I think that is a good thing to invite when students are taking courses, if there's, a, a, if there's consistency in how they're accessing the courses. There are certainly effective design principles that should be integrated into courses. Um, but in terms of templates, I too, I get reluctant. Um, I think for some faculty, they can be helpful to see. I think what's more important is we need faculty to have the opportunity to be participants in a course that is designed effectively and that is taught by a caring, empathetic, present facilitator. And that professional development experience is critical because then you learn from that and you can adapt that to the needs of your own discipline and your own teaching. Wonderful, thank you. Nate, I see your, your wonderful face back up again. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, that was really fantastic. Um, it makes me want to start my design now, <laughs> which in itself is, is an innovation for me rather than waiting until the week before the semester. So thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and to everybody for the questions um, that you've shared in the chat um, and the resources you've shared there. Uh, in addition to Michelle's presentation materials and the recording, we'll also um, uh, digest this chat um, so that we sort of provide all this list of resources and these questions and reflections back to everybody uh, through that conference site. Uh, but yeah, Michelle, thank you so much. Let's just pause and imagine applause in the background and smiles. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and Candace, thank you for moderating. Um, we're going to turn now to our breakout sessions. Um, and we've got some facilitators who've already been sort of pre-assigned to the sessions. Uh, the breakouts will continue until uh, 1245 um, and at 1245 we'll have a pause in our schedule uh, and then restart uh, a new session uh, for the one o'clock keynote with Katie Linder. Uh, so at this point I'm going to open up the breakout rooms and if you've been in Zoom before you know you'll sort of get dispersed um, but I'll be back in the main room if there are any questions uh, that are coming up um, but for right now I'm going to open these breakout rooms and good luck to everyone. Uh, thank you again Michelle and uh, see you in a little bit. Bye-bye.